So welcome to the first um, in the seminar series from the Institute of Data Science and AI. Um, we've been running things virtually, so we're obviously a bit uh, rusty in or organizing something hybrid. So our room is rather tiny, but we'll get a bigger one next time. Uh, so these two sessions are introducing two new academic members of staff from the Computer Science Department. Uh, and the first speaker is Mauricio Alvarez, and I'm going to leave it to Mauricio to introduce his title. So, thank okay. you, Mauricio. Okay, thank you, Magnus. So, do I still have 30 minutes, or? This <laughs> room, actually, for uh, longer than the other one. I'm going to check whether there's anything else in after this room, so I know what it is going over there. I'm so sorry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thanks everybody for coming. I'm going to talk about um, multitask Gaussian processes. Oh, oh, sorry. I have to say, um, based on the Depart oh, Department of Computer Science and the new, newly um, yeah, written Center for AI Fundamentals. Um, so as I was saying before, I want to talk about multi multitask Gaussian processes. And then how we do, how we actually use multitasking process for heterogeneous data sets and aggregated data sets. I'm going to come to that uh, in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, this is working. Okay. So these are the type of problems I'm, I'm interested in. So uh, here on the left, you have a network of sensors, and this is a sketch of the south coast of England. We have some environmental stations here with many environmental sensors, for example, temperature, um, um, atmospheric pressure, the ones here uh, uh, at high height. And, and uh, something that happens very commonly in, in this uh, network of sensors is that some sensors stop working either because the, the sensor fails or the network fails. Um, so what we want to do is to use the information that we can gather jointly from these sensors to try to create a model that is able to impute data in these uh, missing parts here. So uh, the sort of the motivation for this or the underlying assumption is that because there is a common underlying sort of environmental effect going on here, uh, these uh, sensors are capturing sort of similar, we are looking at different parts of the same phenomenon, and then we are able to, to create this joint model to, to, um, to impute that data. I have this other example here that's very common in geostatistics. This, this is a very common in geostatistic problems. Uh, so this is a spatial data set, and each point here on this map is uh, this is the Swiss uh, uh, sketch of the Swiss Jura region. And then <clears throat> on each of these points, we have uh, um, measurements of uh, concentrations of uh, pollutant metals. There was a lot of mining activity going on uh, here so many years ago. And this is a, a setting of something called multifidelity data sets, where usually you will have a task with data that is very expensive to acquire, uh, either because it takes a lot of time or because you have to invest a lot of money or expert knowledge. And then you have another task that actually is very cheap to acquire, but perhaps not at the same quantity. So here with uh, um, copper and lead are usually very expensive to measure, these pollutant metals, but pH level actually is very cheap. So what we want to do is to build the joint model such that at some input locations for which we only have, say, pH level that one of the uh, pollutant metals were able to predict the other one. So, for example, in A, we only uh, will have access to pH level and copper, and then we would like to predict uh, lead having learned a joint model how they do that. Another example, a multi-fidelity setting is this one. So on the top panel, I have a, a, a local sensor of air pollution, and I'm able to get these uh, measurements every minute. And then on the lower panel, the, the black line is a uh, um, it's a high quality sensor, but I'm only take I'm only able to take these measurements every ten to ten minutes. So if I can create a joint model that is able to sort of gather the strengths of each of these data sets, uh, will I be able to uh, make predictions for quite uh, high quality data more frequently? So that's the multi fidelity uh, setting. And for Building these models, I'm going to use the machinery of Gaussian processes. So I feel uh, that I have the obligation to tell you a bit about Gaussian processes. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Uh, so uh, Gaussian processes are basically generalizations of multivariate Gaussian distributions. So multivariate Gaussian distributions apply to finite vectors, whereas Gaussian processes apply to functions. 
So formally speaking, the Gaussian process is a stochastic process such that if I take a finite number of random variables from that process, that process follows a, a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And who here is familiar with multivariate Gaussian distributions? Can you raise your hands? Okay, there are too many people. So multivariate Gaussian distribution is defined by two parameters, a mean vector and a covariance matrix. So because uh, a GP is a generalization of that multivariate Gaussian distribution, I need to define two templates to actually be able to compute a finite vector for the multivariate Gaussian distribution <laughs> and a finite matrix for that multivariate Gaussian distribution. And those two templates are what we call the mean function and the covariance function. So there are some properties that this function covariance needs to follow. But I'm gonna skip that. So we usually use the Gaussian process as a, as a, as a prior distribution for functions uh, in, in, a, in a Bayesian inference approach. So in Bayesian inference, you have a prior distribution that you combine with something called the likelihood function. And uh, based uh, combining those things, you compute something which is called a posterior distribution that is actually useful to do predictions, for example. Uh, so the GP is gonna be our prior distribution for functions, and we're gonna see how do we combine that with data uh, later on. So the most important, uh, usually in machine learning, what we say is that all the, we're gonna assume that this mean function is zero, and then we care more about the covariance. And uh, one typical example of the covariance function is the one that you see here on one dimension. So I'm assuming that X is a state in one value. It's not a vector, it's just a scalar, X and X prime. And I have this shape, which is called usually as the random, uh, sort of radial basis function or square exponential or exponentially quadratic kernel. And it is defined by these two parameters as F, which is the variance parameter and L, which is the landscape parameter. So for example, if I fit, fit those parameters, fix those parameters to one, then I get this expression for the covariance function. And say that I get these values for X, uh, the input value from X1 to Xn. And what I can do with this is now I have a template to be this covariance matrix, which is given by this equation here. And what I do is that I compute that covariance matrix using these inputs. Yeah, so I basically, each of the entries in this covariance matrix is just that function evaluated for a pair of those inputs. Uh, as I said before, we assume this is a, a, a zero mean function in the prior, and then I get this sort of Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian distributions to describe these functions here. So everything that we know of these functions is in the covariance function here. And then if I sample from that Gaussian distribution, this is a multivariate Gaussian distribution, so I can take samples from that for uh, any value of vector n that fits in a computer, then I can do that and I get this kind of shape. So you can start to look, you can start to see that this actually looks like functions are really very smooth functions where this is your input and this is the function that you're getting. Each of these lines is a different sample from your function, which in this case for this covariance is quite smooth. So I can uh, change the parameters of this covariance function. For example, if I reduce the length scale, what I see here is that my functions start to wiggle more, to change more quickly. I can also increase that value, increase that value, and I get that the, the, the functions actually change is lower. Is lower. Uh, I can also change the variance parameter, like this, for example, and then I can represent functions actually have uh, higher amplitudes. That's not the only function that I can uh, come up with. Actually, this is the, perhaps the one that to go to uh, practitioners usually this, you usually use this one uh, as a first choice. But there are many other covariance functions. So for example, the Matern family, given by this expression here, perhaps you can focus on the one in the bottom, which is easier to interpret. And then uh, it also has these two parameters, SF and L, where SF is the variance and L is again the length scale. So this is called the Matern uh, 3, 2, because this parameter B in this family here is 3 over 2. And then if I sample again, I get this type of function. So you, you, you can notice that there is some roughness going on in those uh, samples. So I haven't said anything about data. All what I have said is about this Gaussian object, this Gaussian uh, distribution. But usually what we want to do is to actually do prediction. So I want to use this for data science, yeah? I want to use this for prediction, say. Um, so the way that we do that is that we start with a kind of Gaussian prior that I talked about before with all the assumptions that you want encoded in your covariance function. 
And then what you see here are the samples from that, uh, for example, exponentially quadratic kernel again. What you see in the background, perhaps you see in the background, there is like a, back, a gray background. That's the uncertainty that I, ha that I have over these functions expressed by the Gaussian distribution. And then in practice, what I will have is some data. So here I just have two data points, this point here and this point here. And what I do is that I use my Bayesian machinery, my uh, Bayesian base theorem to update the uncertainty that I had at the beginning, now combined with the data that I have to get to a new uncertainty quantification for my, for my potential observations, which is here. So the line that you see here is the, mean, is the new mean process for the Gaussian process. And then the dashed lines that you see here are new samples that I get from this updated Gaussian process. And then what you see here in the background is the gray, uh, um, so it's, it's expressing the uncertainty about the, uh, given by the predictive variance. Okay, so that's a very quick intro to Gaussian processes. Now, I want to do the dependency uh, structures I was talking about before using this, this uh, framework. And as I said before, the most important thing that I need to define is my covariance function. Um, so one simple thing that I could do is to say, well, I don't know anything about multitask learning, what is that? But I know about GPs now because I've seen four slides of how to do it. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna take each of my tasks and rather to say, oh, I'm gonna learn some dependency between those tasks is just to assume that they are independent, yeah? So I have this data set one for this particular task. For example, this is the high tie, the tie height of one of the uh, sensors that I was telling you before about this network of sensors. And then I, I define my covariance function and then I can compute my kernel matrix to generate these Gaussians and then compute my posterior distribution when I have data. And I could do that for the same, for the other output, say other sensor network, or you know, in the case of the, of the Juda, then the, the, the concentration of these polluter metals, I have a third one, I could do the same, and I could build this joint, the Gaussian process, a big kernel matrix now that involves these three kernel matrices, one per output, but assuming that the uh, uh, terms upside the main diagonal are just basically zero because I assume that they're independent. But that's not what we want because we want to exploit those dependencies. So we need to find a simple way to actually make, mean, and make sense of what these blocks mean. Yeah, and how do we include some sort of dependency accountability here? In a way that this element is still a valid covariance matrix. Okay, so one way of doing it, this is not the only way, but one way of doing it is using this formalism of process convolutions. Yeah? So say that now a bit more formal, we have capital D of these processes or tasks that I want to jointly model. Yeah, and then I'm going to assume that each of those tasks can be expressed through this integration that you see here. So you have this uh, uh, integral in some domain X with this, what we call the smoothing kernel GD, and then a latent process UZ. And then the key here is to assume that this latent process UZ is a, one of those Gaussian process, simple ones that we saw before with a particular a covariance function. And then because this is a linear operation, then your FD is also gonna be a Gaussian process. And what is more important for the talk is that because you are using the same U to express all your, to represent all your outputs from D equals one to capital D, then you are introducing correlations between the representation for the outputs. Um, and if you marginalize U in this model, then you come up, you, you, the, the, the solution to that is gonna be a model that actually uh, includes those dependencies between the different outputs. You can include more than one latent process U. So you can have more than one latent process. So for example, you could have a latent process with a long end scale if you assume that the covariance for this U is a, an RBF covariance. Another one could have a short end scale with different amplitude and so on, okay? But if you assume that these ones are independent and still GPs because of the linearity, again, you're introduced, your, these outputs are gonna be Gaussian and then you can uh, explain the correlation between you know, these outputs. So this is the, a very uh, sort of uh, cartoonish way of looking at this. So you have this latent process, then you do these convolutions with these smoothing kernels, one per output, and then you have the different uh, representations for your outputs. So in this one, you have, you, you, this, this one is approximated more than this one, for example. Okay. Now you end up building this type of covariances. So you are accounting for dependencies now between FD and FD prime, and that's the way that uh, uh, you express those covariances, okay? Good. So this is an example 
uh, that we have the, with two of the, well, actually this, uh, this problem has four sensors, but I'm just showing you two of the sensors. So on your left, this column is showing you the predictions that you would get if you were to assume that the uh, data uh, is independent per sensor. So I actually know all the data and what I did was just to remove a bit of the data here. So you see this dashed line here is the real data. And I fit a, a GP to this, a single GP to this one. And then you see uh, it's actually quite good following the data because it's just doing interpolation. But then for this part, obviously this is challenging task. It's not able to do a good prediction. And then uh, another one, another station, both of them actually should have said before, they're measuring tie height. And then I do the same thing here. I remove a, a bit of data here. And then uh, obviously where you have data, the GP does a good job. It's doing just interpolation, but here you don't get very good results. Now on this column here is, is one of these joint models that has looked at these four data sets. And I'm using it to do the predictions here because they borrow <coughs> information from each other. Then the, uh, actually the prediction is quite, is quite good. So this is a, a multitask approach. Any questions so far? Okay. So we, we wrote this monograph some years ago where we talk about uh, all these models for, for uh, kernels for vector value functions. Now, I want to use this multitask in those particular settings that are very common in, in data science. So one of them is, for example, when you have several variables uh, changing across an independent variable, so it could be a space time, but those variables have uh, a different nature. So one of them, for example, could be count, count data. One of them could be just continuous data. The other one could be just binary data. But you know that somehow they are correlated and you want to exploit those correlations. This is what we call heterogeneous data sets. And the model we refer to as a heterogeneous multitask learning. So this is a very nice application. I was working with some colleagues in Spain as part of this work. Um, uh, is uh, on, on, on human behavior data. And uh, because we have our routines in our life, if we were to just wear, um, you know, have a GPS in our watches or something, we will see there are a lot of common patterns in, in our daily activities during the week and during the weekend. And what they wanted to do was to use that to actually monitor patients that have some sort of mental health condition uh, to see whether they could spot some sort of uh, particular behavior that would require uh, to have an specialist on site where they, these, these people were living. Um, so we are, they, they had these smartphones and they had these uh, variables that they were measuring. So uh, they had lots, lots of variables. We just look at these three variables. So one of them was a binary variable uh, telling us whether the person was at home or not. This one was a, a distance from home. Uh, so it's a continuous variable. And this one was whether the person was using WhatsApp or not. There were other ones like how many apps this person had open in the, in the, in the smartphone and so on. So we know somehow that this might be correlated because uh, because they're coming from the same patient and expressing perhaps some underlying condition. And then uh, what we wanted to do is to use this multitask learning together with a suitable representation of these outcomes so that we could, uh, we could do data science basically. Yeah. So this is the model that, that uh, we have. Um, again, we have three different tasks. But now what we're gonna do is to allow each of the tasks to have a different likelihood function, yeah? So um, this would allow us to represent different types of, of data, really. Uh, so um, each of these likelihood functions is gonna be defined by some, some parameters. And what we do is that each of those parameters is sort of represented through an underlying GP. And we have to use some, some nonlinear transformation of those underlying GPs so that the parameter uh, for that particular likelihood is within the range that is supposed to be. I'll give you some examples later, okay? And all those underlying GPs, basically what we do is that we put a multitask learning uh, prior over them, one of these multitask GP prior, so that we can account for all the dependencies between these different outputs. Okay, so here is just, just, just to put some, some names to this. So say you have three uh, outcomes, three, three, sorry, three outputs. One of them is binary. The other is a, quant, a count variable. The other one is a real variable. And then for the count, sorry, for the binary variable, you assume you are modeling with a, have a nullity distribution for the probability that is equal to one. And they usually use a sigmoid function and the input uh, to that sigmoid function is given by your GP. And then a Poisson you could use, for example, for a count data set uh, where the intensity parameter is a, uh, uh, transformation of the line Gaussian GP and, and just make sure that that parameter is always positive. 
And then you have a third one, which is a, a heterostatic Gaussian, where you allow both the mean and the variance to change with the input location. So in this example with three likelihoods, we have four parameters. So four parameters then represented in, in direct, indirectly through three, four Gaussian processes. And then we put the joint uh, multitask P over these four Gaussian processes. That's the way that we include sort of those dependencies in this, in this type of models. And then how long do I have? Five minutes. Okay, and, and then uh, we have to do Bayesian inference. But Bayesian inference here is not as straightforward as it was in the regression case. So we have to, to, to come with these more sort of sophisticated ways of doing Bayesian inference. Uh, this one is called variational inference. Basically what we do is that just to find an approximate uh, sort of posterior to the real posterior by minimizing something called the, the uh, evidence lower bound. I'm not gonna go through the details of this, obviously. Uh, we combine all these with something called inducing variables which allows us to do uh, large scale data sets. Uh, the details are in the paper. Uh, I'm just gonna skip to these results then. So this is the human behavior data I was showing you before. And we did sort of a similar uh, experiment where we just remove some data uh, uh, for some of the outputs and then look at the uh, prediction that the model would do on those uh, data, those parts of the data were removed. And we assess this in terms of uh, performance which we call the negative log predictive density. Lower is better. So you see that in those variables that I showed you before, those two binary variables, one of them actually uh, do better than this other model, which is just looking at independent, independent of for each output. And then on average, we are, we are um, better. Okay, this is another example where uh, we're looking at this spatial data set of uh, London house prices and the two variables that we were modeling were the type of contract, which is a binary variable. And the other one is the, is the sale price. And then these are the predictions that we do with our model. So this one is the probability of, of uh, the freehold, the type of contract. And then uh, this is the log price, the variance of the log price. Um, also again, compared to this chain model, we see that we do uh, uh, better. Right, so if you want more details, this is a paper we published some years ago. And now the last bit I want to talk about to complete the talk is about aggregated data. So as I said before, you have data that uh, in many studies in data science, you will have like one sensor measuring every minute, another sensor measuring every 10 minutes. So you have a spatial data set where you take, uh, this is, this is uh, happens in demographics data sets where, uh, you know, like uh, maybe some, some variables are measured by postcode, but other variables are measured by individuals, uh, et cetera, or by neighborhoods. And then you want to combine all those uh, into a model. So basically this, the idea is the same. The only thing that changes is that um, prior to uh, using these latent uh, processes, uh, you we integrate them over the support, uh, the compact support or the support that we want to, to uh, refer to that data set. So to that output. So for example, you have, you have a data set that is measured in, in I don't know, in every, uh, every minute, perhaps this is gonna be just one minute uh, of length for time. And then for the other output where it's measured every uh, 10 minutes, this is gonna be uh, integrated over 10 minutes. And then just going back to the initial example that I had, uh, this in this um, panel, we are measuring the variable every minute with a low cost sensor. And then in the bottom, we are measuring this variable every 10 to, 10, 10 to uh, 7 to 10 minutes uh, is the black line that you see here. And then we use both uh, data sets to actually infer what had been the actual uh, high quality data. So the uh, true high quality data is this red one that you see here. And the prediction number of model is the blue one here with some sort of uh, confidence uh, credible inter intervals here. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop here. Thanks. Okay, time for a quick question. Yeah. So I, I first of all, as our background, that's very processing. I wonder why there you can use the function processing for an RP task, for example, the main function and the covariance function you mentioned. I was thinking it might be used for mixed domain and the domain scientific yeah maybe yeah i mean like people on uh, you you might want to follow the work of carl hendrik heck Eck, because he has looked a lot about these type of models where you can express something with a joint model and then having private models for each modality 
Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I guess so. Any more questions or what you plan to say? <coughs> yeah, go on. So, is, so when you're sorry, I was trying to speak with the final piece, <laughs> but I think I got to this a bit. So, when you're building the multi stack, the multi has relation model. Do something in the convolutions, in the coefficients of the convolution tell you about the importance of each input for each output. I mean, you're assuming that there is a relationship between the outputs. Yeah, yeah. And in many cases, that the relationship between some outputs is stronger than the relationship between other outputs. Yeah. And can you say something after you build the model to identify that maybe to remove some of the outputs? Actually, you could get a better model of the others. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like this, this thing that I explained here is like the very, very basic fundamentals. Okay. Yeah, but there is a lot of research on top of this, looking at that kind of question. Because it yeah. would allow you to explain. Yeah, yeah. Connection. I mean, there are all sorts of problems because you could also be assuming things that do not exist, like imposing sort of dependency where there is no dependency. Okay. So, so those kind of uh, objects, as you were saying, will give you some idea of whether that's that's perhaps wrong or. Okay, thanks. I yeah. think it's better move on to wave yeah. hands to be fair. So you both just say a the time. So uh wave hands started recently as a senior lecturer in machine learning, also in the Department of Computer Science, and he's gonna talk about Bayesian reinforcement learning for robot control. So over to you, Wave, if it's all yeah. working on. We're two projects. Is it working? Oh, that's the question. One more question. Oh, any insight from London housing price analysis? Any buying suggestion? <laughs> uh, I think how to how to hide this? Yeah, under more, I think. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for waiting. And uh, today, we're going to talk about Bayesian reinforcement learning for robot control. So uh, I say Bayes is for Bayesian, who was born like uh, 17th centuries, so it's like 300 years ago. And the Bellman is for reinforcement learning, who was born in 1920 in the US. And uh, Leopold is for control, so who was born around 18th centuries in Russia Empire. So basically today, I'm gonna to use the 300 years of knowledge from three different countries for robotics. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so uh, this is all of this talk. First, I'm gonna give some introduction about, about myself and about my research. Then I'm gonna meet with the first two person, Bayes and the Bellman regarding Bayesian reinforced learning. So Bayesian reinforced learning can be used for control. And then later, we'll introduce the third person, Leap Noob, why? Because for robot control, it often happens in the safety critical scenarios. So we need Liap Nuov to, to give us the tool to show safety certificate. And the last, I'm gonna show some demos from different applications from air, then space and cyber. So uh, I'm Wei, uh, I got my degree in control engineering from China and I got my PhD from Imperial working on system and application. Then I moved back to China, work for the drone company, DJI. Then I moved to uh, Netherlands, work as assistant professor in robot dynamics in Tildoft. And recently, a couple of months ago, I moved to Manchester as a senior lecturer in machine learning. Right, I work on robotics. I think uh, uh, to start with, maybe I can show you something. Uh, that recently Tesla is working on humanoid robot. Let's see what's happened. Uh, Yeah, with, with the degrees of freedom that we expect to have. Yeah. Uh, welcome. 
So I can, we can see that Elon Musk is pretty happy with the product, but I think we are not happy because it's not that impressive because somebody can hold it and the human robot is not working autonomously. But I do, aspect, I do um, acknowledge the inspiration that I think people around, I, I think many, many people had a dream of pursuing a unified theory of artificial intelligence to create a general intelligent agent for the well-being of humanity. And my goal is to use the robot to realize the universal agent with autonomous perception, cognition, decision making, learning, control, and social cooperation capabilities, which are in line with the safety, security, privacy, human emotions, ethics, and moral concept. And my focus is more on the learning and control part. I play a lot with different kinds of robots. Well, my research touch upon decision making and position and perception. And I'm happy to find that many colleagues in Manchester are working on the other different aspects which help me to achieve my goal. And I believe beyond the humanoid robot, this artificial general intelligence agent can be implemented across different robot platforms for particular applications. So what exactly am I doing technically? So to control a robot is very much like we control our arm to move the fingers from the right point to the green point. Okay, so the visual information of the arm and our finger will be transmitted to the visual cortex. Then a motor signal will be transmitted to a cerebellum, okay? Combined the, with the proprioceptive state, for example, the position of the arm, the angle of the arm, a control command will be transmitted to our muscle to drive the muscle and drive our finger to move. How to translate it into robotics? Well, if you want to control a robot, you have to understand how the robot works. That is to know the dynamics of the robot. And also we want to track our finger. It's preferably we can predict the motion of our finger. This is known as system identification and state estimation. That is from state to dynamics. On the high level part of our brain, so that is used for planning and control. However, robots are different from human, right? So it's kind of, it's a piece of hardware. So you have to adapt the algorithm and implement the algorithm to the particular app, to the particular hardware and to adapt the deployment. And my research uh, group is focusing on using machine learning for robot control. And we made contributions in these three important papers. However, the conventional machine learning cannot be used directly to robot control because we don't have a lot of data. And we really need a accurate estimate, preferably it is a distribution, which can help us to quantify the uncertainty. And most of the time, we don't have extensive computational resource. We just use the robot and we have the mini chip, then we have a very limited resource. Of course, you can use the cloud resource to do the computation, but you have the problem with the communication latency or you have the vulnerability for cyber attacks. And we found, and we believe, Bayesian learning is very promising to solve these challenges. So our aim is to build robot Bayesian brain. And we believe this robot Bayesian brain can be used and implemented across different robot platforms. So recently we joined uh, uh, Manchester and we found that Manchester is very strong in robotics. And I believe together with my colleagues in the Center for AI Fundamentals, that we can be the enabling factor to push forward the development of robotics in Manchester. Okay, so when I talk about machine learning for robot control, I mainly talk about reinforcement learning. So what is reinforcement learning? Why reinforcement learning and why not reinforcement learning? So reinforcement learning sits at the intersection of many fields of science and each of these fields has a branch that is trying to start with the same problem as RL. That is the science of decision-making. And there's no supervisor, only a reward signal obtained by trial and error, and the time really matters. So essentially, it is a sequential decision-making problem. And as you can see from the media, from the social, uh, from the TV and the, tele and, the tele and the magazine and so on and so forth, reinforcement learning has achieved a very impressive performance in many different tasks. For example, beat championship in goal. So what is reinforcement learning? So in reinforcement learning, there is an environment, there is an agent. So let's take an example of uh, robotics. For example, you want a drone deliver some parcel from point A to point B and then maintain in this desired height, okay? So the environment is actually the robot per se. So 
this is the dynamics of the environment, but also the altering environment around the, around this drone. And you have the state, states like the height, the velocity, angle, and so on and so forth. And you have the reward. Reward is like the distance between the actual head to the desired head. All right. So the environment of the robot transmits the state and the reward for agent. Agent is like an algorithm. So it's smart or the intelligent thing to tell the drone to where to fly and how to fly. So it's the algorithm inside the drone. All right. So this agent takes information and generate some control actions to tell the drone, okay, go fly this way, then interact with the environment, so on and so forth, through trial and error, and hopefully we can learn a nice control strategy to drive the drone from, uh, to deliver the parcel. And there are states, for example, more mathematically, there are state S, action A, policy pi, we have a data trajectory, basically sums the data from zero to a long time in the future. Then we have the reward, and all the things, all the environment can be modeled as a markup decision process. So it basically says the next state depends on the current state and the current action, not before. And then we can write the probability of a trajectory as follows. We have the return. So we not only focus on the current reward, we want to sum them up into the very future. And the most, um, uh, most likely, we're going to focus on the recent reward. Well, we're going to focus less on the future reward. So that's why we have the discounted return. Then we have everything. Uh, so the Z here is called a state action pair is STAT, state and action. So we can write the state action transition dynamics. Well, there are two important functions. One is the action value function, which is the expectation of the discounted return given a particular action. And the state value function is expectation of the action, action value function given a particular policy. If you sample all action from this distribution of the policy, you can get expectation of the state value function. Then advantage function is difference between the action value function and state value function. And our objective is the expected return under the policy pi, which is the expectation of the discounted reward into the future. So our goal is actually to sample these data set, these trajectories, and hopefully that we find a policy pi which can maximize this objective function and we can train a nice policy or controller to try uh, to control the drone to move smoothly as quickly as possible to the desired height. However, to maximize the re return, uh, the expected return is difficult because you're gonna sample a lot of data. So you're gonna have the problem of, of cursed, cursed dimensionality. So that's why we're using the value as approximation uh, for the expected return to maximize that to get an optimal policy. All right, so that's why we're gonna use the celebrity Bellman equation, which you solve recursively from backwards as in we do in dynamic programming to get an optimal value function. Then after that, we get a Bellman optimal, optimality equation to get an optimal policy, okay. And there are many methods to solve that. I, I will not cover that. For example, like a value function method, policy search method, and you can combine the value function method and policy search method as the actor critical method. And there are also model-based uh, uh, RL and model-free RL. So essentially, they are all machine learning methods. But the difference is that in model-based method, you try to learn the mathematical model of the environment and use the model for planning purpose, which is more data efficient. Okay. Okay. RL is good. RL is impressive. But there is a problem. The problem of reinforced learning is that there's a lack of certificate for performance guarantee. So the control performance will deteriorate in adversarial scenarios. For example, uncertainty propagations from sensors <coughs> to actuators, cyber attacks, external distances, or arbitrary safety and physical constraints, right? And more formally, certificate can be defined as the formal and explicit proof to guarantee control performance and the regenerative actions in adversarial scenarios. For example, there are detection duration, uh, recovery duration, resiliency, robustness, and uh, status state error, and so on and so forth. And in this talk, I will focus on the safety constraint. Okay. So why Bayesian learning? Can Bayesian learning be the remedy to solve these challenge, challenges in reinforced learning? Well, the answer is yes and no. But before we introduce Leap Nov, we definitely need Bayesian, Bayesian learning. So thanks, Mauricio, uh, that introduced the Gaussian process and the Bayesian learning uh, from scratch. So I'm going to skip that. But in Bayesian learning, basically, you have a prior, you have a likelihood, you have a uh, posterior, you want to maximize the marginal likelihood, evidence, and so on and so forth. So, okay. 
of course, there are some advantages because if you're using the Bayesian learning, you can capture the uncertainty by probability distribution, right? So you see the error bar in uh, Mauricio's slide, right? And also, it is a natural optimization for exploration and exploration and exploitation trade-off, and it's a unified framework for many other uh, learning methods like plain reinforced learning, inverse reinforced learning, multi-agent reinforced learning, imitation learning, active learning, and so on and so forth. However, Bayesian methods are sporadically used in RL. Why? Because the most important thing, or I think the first thing to do is to specify a prior, but there's no guideline to specify prior for reinforcement learning. So how, how to specify prior? On model parameters, on value functions, on policy and so on? Well, <laughs> challenge means opportunity. So the question we want to ask is, could desire to control performance related properties that I showed in the previous slide be encoded as priors? So at least if we're not solving Bayesian problem, at least we have some kind of working optimization problem. So think about the lasso, the L1 regularized uh, linear regression versus the Bayesian linear regression with lapses prior. Good, let's try that. So as you can see, I mentioned the safety, right? So what exactly is safety? So we're gonna meet the third person, Leop Nuov from Control that show how to construct this prior and how to show the a theoretical result, how to construct the certificate. So let's move to the control. So everything is deterministic now. So typically a robot can be described by a differential equation or a different equation, right? So think about everything is deterministic. We don't have probability because probability is one. So everything is deterministic. And the stability certificate is, is like, you can construct a control, control function. V, which is positive, is the scalar function, and the derivative over time, or the difference over time for the discrete time case, is non-positive. Well, for safety certificate is that you can construct a control barrier function, which is non-positive in the safety side, okay? It is positive in the unsafe side, and the derivative over time, or the difference over time, is non-positive. So this is decreasing over time. Okay, this is decreasing over time. You can also unify the stability and the safety certificate by constructing control Lyapunov barrier function, which is as follows. So it's very similar to the previous two. So the derivative of this control Lyapunov barrier function over time is non-positive, and the difference over time is non-positive. So how to obtain the certificate? As I said in the previous slide, you have to construct. So construct means that you have to use your intelligent intelligence to labor designed a function. So that's why we call it construction. There's no automatic way. So there are, it is, uh, it, it is um, um, a long story and the long lasting research in control theory. But for us, our idea is that we want to learn the certificate from the data in Bayesian reinforcement learning. So first we want to force the value function to be the certificate candidate and a second, we want to specify a stable and a safe priors on the value function. Here it is the key. Value function is the certificate, certificate candidate. So we'll focus on the control and variable function. Then we specify a control and variable function as the value function. Then we can construct the prior distribution PV encoding the following, the following inequalities in control, the up and variable function. Okay. Then if we can construct that, we can use the Bayesian, basically simply use the Bayesian rules, guess the posterior of the value function over the observation, basically the reward. So how to learn a safe value function? Okay, and in the following, it's a bit uh, technical, so I try not to convince you to understand everything, but I try to follow that for the purpose of recording and uh, to get to know that what is going really going on. So basically you can use a tempo difference learning, then, you can uh, uh, stack the observations from t from zero to from t. So essentially, you try to solve a linear regression problem. But how the key step is encode the energy decreasing inequality as constraints. So we can encode this first order difference function b to represent the difference of the value function over time. And we can encode these energy decreasing inequalities as a constraint to as, as a constraint for the regression problem. However, 
there are two problems. The first problem is that V and Q are in function space. And the second, V is the constraint and not Q. Um, I think due to, uh, I think the key idea is that we want to make a plan to get a V and a Q. So first we specify the V and the Q as Gaussian process. And the second, we first, we want to get a posterior estimation of the certificate. First in the constraint case, we can derive Q from V. With this understanding, we can move on. In the constraint case, derive Q from V and this BV, that is that is the, this distribution, right? Then we can use the policy search. You can use the policy search method for the obtain the Q. Then we are done. So I think due to time limitation, maybe I just skipped the technical part. It's a bit uh, complicated, <laughs> yeah. But okay. Anyway, this is not a show up, but I want to show you that, okay, everything is rigorously derived. So everything is actually analytic, analytical. So you can use the result uh, with very high confidence. So um, just, I think it's too blank to say the theory. Let's just see the, uh, the demos. Okay. So well, we try different things. The first that we tried a whole lot of 2D navigation. So the idea is that we want the drone fly from around this region to this region without colliding with the obstacles. Well, this is difficult because the geometry of the obstacle is strange. So it's very challenging for the conventional uh, path planning or motion planning algorithm. So let's see what happens. You see here, this is actually not wrong because there is a function to push, push the drone uh, uh, beyond the obstacle. Okay. Yeah, there we go. And the next, we also try on the autonomous driving land application, which is safe reinforced learning for UGV control. So we want to design an end-to-end -end <coughs> algorithm to drive a car in different scenarios. So let's see the uh, demo. So we try on the off-road uneven surface. And also you can see that there is an obstacle here. So we try to avoid the obstacle and go smoothly in the urban area. And also we extend it to the multi-agent case, which is the leader follower. So this is the leader, this is the follower. And the follower want to follow the leader in a strict line without colliding with the obstacle. And here they want to track a circle with collision avoidance, <laughs> yeah. And the next thing is space. So this space is a bit uh, uh, interesting because this one is pushed air. It's called air bearing test bath. So think about this, the satellite, and this is the space station, and this is like an astronaut. So when the docking to the target, you try to avoid this astronaut. And let's see what happened. So there are two three stages operating, proximity operation and the docking. So this is a basic reinforced learning with control layout and variable function priors. Good. And this is a uh, comparison with the classical method in uh, uh, motion planning and the past planning. And this is a well-known model predictive control or control of, uh, for example, the autonomous driving. Because MPC requires a large amount of uh, computation. So uh, this kind of thing just doesn't work. And the last, I want to show uh, a secure control and a separate attack. As I mentioned, if you're using a cloud, you want to use the GPS, then there's a vulnerability for the separate attack uh, to the uh, sensor from the steal the sensor data or change the actuator data and so on and so forth. And in this setup, for example, this is a hacker and try to abstract the central data and change something to the computer to change the command of this uh, uh, vehicle. And let's see what happens. This enter control is like, uh, this is just a wiggle around. Okay, it's weird. But for this one, it looks pretty good. 
But although it's not perfect, but it still kind of slowly wiggle around. But uh, yeah, it, it works. So conclude. So uh, there's a beautiful marriage between uh, control theory and machine learning. And we can use, especially using the Bayesian learning, we can apply uh, successfully for robot control. And for future directions, and one thing is a theory because there are so many performance uh, things we're gonna derive. And on the machine learning side, we have to show this convergence and uh, 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 sample complexity and so on and so forth. And the second is actually everything we show here is fully autonomous, but very important thing is human in the loop. So how to collaborate, uh, how to make the human collaborate with the robot is one important uh, direction. And the last is application at scale. So beyond this, we just show some demos on some robot, but I think for uh, application at scale, for example, to solve some of the most challenging problems in energy, you know, uh, climate change and so on and so forth, need collaborations. And I believe that uh, uh, we guys can collaborate together to make uh, Manchester the best place for robotics, machine learning, data science, and AI. Thanks. One more thing, the paper message. We want to make robots intelligent also under control. Thanks.